Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Sam. Um, welcome to the OHBM Brain Hack 2020. Uh, this is a train track session on bids and bids apps. Um, I'll start by saying unequivocally that Black Lives Matter and that one of the most important things we can be doing right now is figuring out how to act in solidarity with and provide material support to the black communities and anti-fascists that are currently struggling against white supremacy and state sanctioned violence from the police. Um, so if you spend the next hour um, doing that instead of listening to this talk, that will be time well spent. Um, in terms of the presentation, um, I'm used to giving sort of conversational interactive talks. Um, I'm not an expert in kind of pre-recording a talk like this. Um, so I apologize for that. I'm gonna keep it kind of uh, informal. Um, so like I said, this talk is about um, uh, bids and bids apps um, called the benefits of bids, um, data standardization and automated processing for neuroimaging research. Now I am not the sort of creator of bids. I'm not even really a, um, a, a contributor to, to bids. I am just sort of acting as a cheerleader here because I think that it is a, a hugely important step forward um, for our field um, and we should all kind of work to um, increase the adoption of this. Um, so with that said, um, I will um, First of all, thank the uh, many, many contributors uh, to BIDS. BIDS is a very community-driven um, uh, project. Um, and you'll see here, uh, in, in many places in my slides, um, things that are this color blue like this are actually clickable links. Um, so if you click here, this is gonna bring up uh, the actual contributors list from the BIDS specification GitHub repo. And you can see many people here, I don't have time to go through all of these people, but it's a lot of people from uh, Russ Poldrak's lab, Chris Gordolevsky, um, uh, Stefan Applehoff, um, Franklin Feingold, Tion Brooks, Chris Markovich, and so forth. Um, uh, so um, what is BIDS? BIDS uh, is the brain imaging data structure. Um, so BIDS is a standard for organizing neuroimaging data that facilitates reuse and automated processing. And I'm going to unpack these terms, reuse and automated processing, as we go here. Um, the BID standard specifies machine-readable directory structures, file names, file formats, and metadata. Um, machine-readable is the kind of, uh, is the keyword here, um, and this rich metadata is going to um, uh, be very important for our purposes later on. Um, the BIDS is a commu consensus-based, community-driven um, uh, project, um, and it capitalizes on existing conventions, existing software tools, and things like that. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. And there's a big emphasis on simplicity, readability, and accessibility. Um, and, uh, Something like this won't work unless it's easy to use and widely adopted. Um, and so you have this kind of balancing act between creating something that is both machine readable and human readable. Um, and bids really developed out of the um, uh, the open fMRI uh, data sharing portal um, and, and uh, repository that has evolved into the open uh, neuro open um, the open neuro uh, data repository and when you start to share data like this you begin to see just the, the importance of, of, uh, of creating a standard of basically all of us speaking the same language when it comes to um, the data that we're trying to share and analyze and just a little extra credit here um, uh, pointing towards the FAIR principles. Um, and this is, a, this is a kind of ideal put forward for um, data sharing and reproducibility and things like this, saying that these uh, data like this should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and uh, reusable. And I think that BIDS actually takes us uh, quite a long way um, in, in, in this direction, uh, lead, uh, living up to the FAIR principles. Uh, one more uh, thing that I'll point out here is that um, all of the little references that I have in the corner here are also clickable links that will take you, that have the DOI will take you to these papers if you want to read further about any particular um, topic here. Um, so uh, what's the point of all of this? Um, I've spent some time of my life kind of trying to convince other people to switch to bids. There's often a lot of friction or pushback or things like this. The way that I uh, like to start this, uh, start, start that process is by asking, have you ever actually tried to reanalyze um, someone else's data? 
um, it's extremely challenging. And I'll, I'll say, I'll go ahead and say, even trying to reanalyze your own data, you know, from a year ago, from five years ago, can be very difficult. I know that I have data sets from, you know, that I collected in 2015 or something like that. I want to go back and reanalyze that data set. It's basically like starting from scratch. I have to figure out what kind of crazy heuristic I, I used to organize the files. What was the input to output to this in the output of this script? Um, it, again, it's sort of like relearning whatever idiosyncratic language um, you were thinking at the time. And one of the main goals of, of coming to this uh, uh, um, shared language uh, in terms of data is uh, feeling confident in the data, in other people's data and using other people's data, being able to trust other people's um, data, not having to you know, email them constantly asking like, why is this name this? Or which one of these is, is the right one? Or why is this organized in this particular way? The data set should basically be the metadata, right? The data set should basically be self-explanatory, should speak for itself, um, uh, kind of like live on its own um, uh, 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 outside of the uh, purview of the uh, data generators or the initial authors. Um, so the initial bids paper um, came out um, in 2016, and at that time they were saying to date, in 2016, um, there has been no consensus about how to organize and share neuroimaging data, leading researchers, even those working within the same lab, to arrange their data in different and idiosyncratic ways. Lack of consensus leads to misunderstanding and time wasted on rearranging data or rewriting scripts that expect particular file formats and organization, as well as a possible cause of errors. That's the kind of problem that we're trying to solve here uh, with bids. Um, uh, I, I, I want to focus for a second on this uh, issue of data sharing. Um, data sharing is exceptionally um, important. Um, public well-curated data sets have been tremendously uh, beneficial. Um, think of fields like machine learning where you have things like ImageNet and MNIST and COCO. These things not only do these things serve like a really important um, uh, didactic role in like understanding how to um, uh, analyze particular data sets or something like that, but these fields tend to, um, w when you have a really good um, benchmark data set, the field is able to kind of like run up against this data set um, and build models and test models and um, compare models. And that's when you see these really kind of big acceleration uh, moments until they completely exhaust that data set. And now it's time for the next really big um, important data set. And I think we'll see this, we're seeing it already, but we'll see it even more um, in neuroimaging as data sharing um, and big sort of consortia become uh, uh, the standard. Um, and I just wanted to point to a statistic from uh, Michael Millam's group um, uh, suggesting that publicly shared fMRI data sets from the Indy Consortia have saved an estimated $1.7 billion in data generation costs, right? And this is a real humanitarian kind of issue because th that's people's tax dollars um, that would otherwise have gone into generating what is oftentimes redundant um, uh, data. And that, that estimate doesn't even include these huge data sets like HCP, all of the things on open neuro, the ABCD data set, or the UK biobank, right? So the, so the, 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 um, the, the societal benefits of data sharing are huge. Um, automated processing is also a, a really important thing, and there's a recent Nature paper on this um, uh, really driving this point home that neuroimaging analysis is very complex and also very flexible, right? It's a multi-stage um, process um, with a variety of kind of like a, a branching paths, a variety of possible analysis choices um, at each stage with these researcher degrees of uh, freedom. And Putting together a machine readable um, standard uh, for data organization like bids with this kind of rich uh, metadata allows us to build these kind of automated processing um, tools. And this is important because it minimizes all the kind of like manual intervention and the way people like will gear a processing pipeline just for the sort of like experiments they typically do or their lab typically does. And um, the way these tools are made, the way these bids apps are made, um, is that they, they also maximize the kind of reproducible execution, reproducibility um, uh, via containerization and, and, and uh, moving towards better content tracking as well. And again, we'll, that, that, uh, we'll get to that more um, later. Okay, so the initial bids paper um, came out in Scientific Data in um, 2016 from Chris Gordolevsky. Um, but things have, the, the ball has kept rolling um, since then. The community has um, kept expanding the bids ecosystem. 
Um, so uh, in 2018, we have the um, MEG uh, bid standard, the bid, MEG bids extension um, was sort of ratified, let's say. And um, following that, we have the um, EEG bids and the intracranial um, or ECOG bids um, data structures uh, that have been uh, finalized and published as well. So um, you can see that the ecosystem is expanding and we'll talk more about that later. Um, I am really um, uh, most familiar with the fMRI literature and bids in the context of fMRI. So for this um, session, I'm mostly gonna be talking about uh, uh, the initial 2016 bids uh, format um, uh, for fMRI data. Um, but most of the things that you sort of learn from you know, thinking about bids in terms of fMRI are, are, are similarly applicable to other um, uh, modalities. Um, so when you start working with bids, um, you'll often find yourself whether you're whether you're kind of whether you're trying to convert a new data, a pre-existing data set to bids, or you're trying to start an analysis on a data set that's already in bids. Um, one of the places that you'll often find yourself is the bids um, website here, and um, this is basically where you'll want to go to navigate the bid specification and so forth. And there's a couple things that I'll, before we really get into the nitty gritty of the specification, there's a couple um, things that I'll uh, point out here. Uh, first of all is um, getting involved in bids. Um, like I said, bids is very community driven and um, any one of you could become a contributor to bids in the next couple days over the course of this hackathon. You can be sure that there will be hackathon projects um, having to do with bids and bids apps uh, over the next day or two. Um, uh, some easy ways to sort of um, uh, start easing yourself into this. I, I encourage everyone to check out Neurostars. Neurostars is sort of like a stack overflow kind of thing for um, neuroscientists, INCF funded question and answer forum. Um, you can check out the bids tag there. Again, these are links that you can um, click on. And um, uh, you can also check out the bids GitHub repository. You can raise an issue there if you have questions um, or fork it, start making your own modifications, whatever you want to do. Um, but I would really check out the um, uh, bids code of conduct as well. Um, and then, you know, I had mentioned MEG bids, EEG bids, um, IEEG bids. Um, these kinds of extensions to the bids um, uh, ecosystem um, start in this form of what are called bids extension proposals or BEPs. Um, and so this is a this is a community driven model for um, expanding the bids ecosystem. There's a pretty detailed set of guidelines for how this is um, for how, how, how the community how the bids people expect this to be done. Here I just want to point I'm not going to go into detail about that. I'm just going to point out here that there are at least like 20 bids um, extension proposals that are currently under uh, development. Um, and these are just Google Docs, right? You can you can you can go look at this Google Doc. You can make suggestions and so forth. Try to understand what the current sort of what people are thinking the way this should work is, right? And if you have some input, you can um, supply it there. Um, they're doing this for different neuroimaging modalities like CT and PET and NIRS um, for different types of derivatives or functional derivatives, structural derivatives, diffusion derivatives, and for different components of the um, software ecosystem like statistical models and image transformations and provenance, execution, um, things like that. So I really recommend checking that out under the Get Involved tab here. Um, I'll also point for a moment to the governance tab here. I'm, I keep emphasizing this community-driven um, development. Um, the way bids works is you have these, you have a steering committee, um, you have working groups, interest groups, all of which are democ democratically elected by um, folks that are involved uh, in bids. Um, and I'll, I'll just highlight, this is, this is sort of rehashing things that I've already said, but I want to keep highlighting the kind of central tenets of how bids, you know, we want bids to work, which is we want to minimize complexity and we want to facilitate adoption. Um, we want to reuse existing methods and technologies uh, wherever possible, not reinventing the wheel. Um, and this is really important. We want to, we want to try to tackle 80% of the most commonly used neuroimaging data derivatives and models. Trying to get 100% is basically impossible. You can't cover everything. Um, so you want to try to figure out where that, you know, the, 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 the center of mass is for most of the people that are using these kinds of um, tools and shoot for that. And adoption by the global neuroimaging community um, is the only way that this really ends up working in the long run, right? And so trying to really cast a wide net to be as inclusive as possible and bring in input from everywhere that we can um, to try to uh, uh, pin down exactly how we want the bids specification to work. 
Okay, um, so getting down to business here um, with the specification itself, um, you, again, you can follow along on the website if you'd like to. Um, I'm going to kind of just walk through things, but the bid specification itself is what's going to take us um, from whatever, you know, the DICOMs that our scanner is printing out into this nice both human readable and machine readable um, format uh, on the other side here. I'll walk through a um, schematic example of this. I just created this by hand um, uh, of what this, uh, what this bid structure would look like. Um, keep in mind that there's a whole GitHub repo of like lightweight, these are, these are example bids data sets that don't actually have the um, heavy data in them. It's really just the structure of the data, but this is great if you want to sort of prototype um, uh, uh, tools that work with bids and so forth. So I'd recommend checking out the bids examples um, repo on GitHub. Okay, so what do we have here in this schematic example? Um, the very top level where I'm just calling it data set here, this is your kind of, this, this is your um, uh, top level um, bids directory, okay? Um, uh, and uh, within that, you're going to, what's, what's highlighted in yellow here are some kind of top level files, metadata, um, and uh, this includes this participants.tsv file, which I'll show you in a little bit. Um, tab separated table, um, it's got participant labels and demographics, condition information, and so forth. Um, a data set description that's in this JSON format that's kind of like a key value um, format that I'll show you later on as well. Um, and uh, then some other files like a readme that just um, gives you kind of um, a verbal explanation of uh, what's going on with this data set and a change log um, so that you can keep up with what version of the data set you're currently working on and how it has kind of evolved uh, over time. Um, Next, you'll see I have these subject uh, directories here, sub 01, sub 02, sub 03. Um, uh, this is where the real kind of uh, data is going to, the raw um, uh, neuroimaging data is going to live. Um, in, the, in the fMRI case, this is going to be your NIFTY images and so forth. Um, so this is gonna be your subject specific anatomical and functional NIFTY images. Um, every, in, for the most part, these NIFTY images are going to be accompanied by what we're calling JSON sidecar files. I'll show you one later on, but these these are these capture the metadata that's not like important metadata that's not necessarily captured in like the nifty image itself, like acquisition parameters and things like that. Um, in this all, example, I also have a, a events.tsv file. Um, that's really important for, you know, it's, it's hard to analyze a neuroimaging data set if you don't know what was happening over the course of the scan, right? So I'll show you an example of that, but it's really just capturing this kind of like event or block or um, stimulus task structure that's going on in your uh, fMRI experiment. And then finally, you have some more kind of um, loosely structured directories um, for code, your analysis code, um, for uh, derivatives of your analyses, like from things like from MRI QC and fMRI prep, which we'll talk more about later, and for uh, stimuli as well, if, if it's possible to provide um, stimuli. Okay, so that's, that's the schematic example. Let's try like a real life um, example here. And this is gonna be, this is a, a Open Neuro Dataset 000233. Um, this is one of my um, shared uh, data sets, so I'm sort of very familiar with the structure of it. Um, uh, and you can click here if you wanna navigate to Open Neuro where this data set um, lives. Uh, okay, and th this, this little summary here is just telling you, okay, who owns this data set, how many subjects, 12 subjects in this data set, it's about four gigabytes, um, there are two different tasks, um, and some different types of um, file, different types of files in here. Um, this uh, is actually telling us, um, uh, this, is, this is a little glance at the kind of uh, uh, directory structure uh, that we have here. So you can see a lot of things recapitulated here um, uh, from the schematic example. You see the um, change log, the data set description, the participants file, and um, so forth. So let's have a look at a couple of these. Um, so if we open up this changes, oops, if we open up this changes file, um, I actually cut off a little bit here because I 
screwed up this changes file at one point. Um, uh, but you can see the kind of release history here, the version history, right? So you see the initial release in um, 2017, and then at some point I added more derivatives and code, and then I wrote a paper about it, and, um, and then I eventually added the um, uh, shared stimulators. You get some history of the data set here. This is not the most sophisticated way to um, uh, track the provenance of this data set. These are things that I'm just writing into here. Um, and we'll, we'll, I, I, I'll mention in passing um, later on a more sophisticated way that we can do content tracking um, with data lab. Um, so that's your changes file. Um, the readme in this data set just has a little description and a, you know, a couple um, caveats uh, that came up during data collection. Won't dwell on that. Um, this is what the participants TSV file looks like uh, for this um, data set. Um, we have these sort of long um, subject IDs here, but that's not really important. You have this um, column structure where your first column is participant ID, your second column is age, you have a sex column here, and group. In this case, these were all just um, sort of typical subjects um, with no uh, 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 between group manipulation going on uh, or between subject manipulation going on here. So I just have them labeled um, as controls. Um, keep in mind that this is like a relatively minimal example. You can um, uh, fill this out um, a lot more, right? If you have a lot of other interesting kind of um, subject demographics, you can fill those out into this um, uh, participants TSV. If you want to get um, if you want to get creative with that, all that the bids asks of you is that you also include a participants JSON file that basically tells us what do these column names um, actually mean. I don't have that in this particular example, um, but that's sort of best practices. Um, Let's check out the data set description file here. Yeah, just so this is another, so this is this kind of JSON format, right? Um, if, if you're familiar with Python, it's very similar to the way that a Python dictionary um, is set up, uh, where in the, in the curly brackets here, you have a key. Uh, the first key here is acknowledgments, and that key is colon um, uh, attached to a particular value, which is the acknowledgments section for this data set. You have another key that's at the authors, which has a list of the authors, and so forth. Um, this is actually, you know, on Open Neuro, it's sort of, it's reading this data set description to populate the, um, uh, uh, to render the, the, the web page for the data set with this, with the correct um, information. Okay, so that's this, that's a lot of this kind of top level um, metadata here. We can dig a little bit further in. Let's skip down to um, subject RID 00001 here. Um, and so inside this subject's um, directory, again, this is not derivatives or anything like that. This is just the raw um, nifty images for this subject. Um, we have a split between um, anatomical and functional um, data, so a NAT and FUNC. Um, if you were to have field maps or diffusion or all sorts of other things like that, th these would uh, be in separate folders here. But here we just have anatomicals um, and functionals. So um, let's have a look inside the uh, anatomical directory here. There's some strange things in here that I wouldn't worry about, but the main thing to keep in mind here is we just have this um, uh, anatomical file, um, sub RID 00001 underscore T1, um, uh, and it's a GZIP nifty. Um, you'll notice uh, these um, file names also sort of share this key value kind of structure here. So um, each key value pair is separated by an underscore um, and the key and the value are uh, linked by a um, hyphen here. So um, sub is a key for subject and this subject value is RID 00001. Um, and uh, this file ends in this kind of suffix uh, that is uh, T1W, just indicating this is a T1-weighted uh, structural image. Okay, um, have a look at the functional um, directory here. Um, you see a lot of similar things, right? So here's your um, uh, functional uh, nifty image. Again, you can see this kind of key value structure in the file name here. You have sub RID 00001. Um, you have a task key that is, in this case, um, uh, uh, has the the BEH or behavior um, uh, uh, value. You have a run key with run one is the value, um, and then it ends with this bold um, suffix. Here you can also see these um, uh, JSON uh, sidecar here that's just the same exact file name but with .json instead of .nifty.gz, and you have the events.tsv uh, accompanying this file as well. So it's 
look for one second at this JSON, um, right? So this is a key value dictionary here. And this has a lot of um, important uh, acquisition parameters and things like that, right? So we have the, the, the repetition time or the TR here, um, the task name for this particular um, uh, uh, acquisition, um, the echo time or TE, the flip angle, um, the slice timing, and uh, so forth, right? This is, this is, um, this is all the information that in an ideal world you would be reporting in the methods section, you know, following the uh, OHBM's COBITAS guidelines or something like this. You want to put all of that um, uh, into your paper, but it should also live alongside with the data set so that um, uh, it can be machine readable uh, as well. Um, we'll also have a look at uh, the uh, events.tsv for this acquisition. Um, and you'll see this was a kind of, um, uh, this was like a, a, a pretty rapid event related uh, design with, um, you know, so at, the, at 12 seconds, the first stimulus appeared and it was two seconds long. And the trial type for the stimulus was an ungulate, some kind of like a deer or something like that running. Um, and I have the condition information here, like the taxonomy is ungulate, the behavior is running. Um, the task that they're doing for this entire run is behavior. Um, this is not a repetition trial. Um, a repetition trial does occur um, later on. It's a behavior repetition, and you can see that the subject correctly responded, or the subject responded to this um, in uh, um, uh, uh, with this particular response time. Um, so this is what allows you to really analyze this um, data set. Otherwise, it's just a sort of time series of fMRI data with no real structure to it. Here you have all of the events. This is what you would use to build your um, design matrix for your GLM or um, something like that, or, or to decide what um, stimuli, or what, what patterns are going to respond, correspond to what stimulus uh, for your classifier and, and so forth. Okay. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll touch on the last, um, there's, there's at the top level, there's also these other folders, derivatives, code, stimuli, things like that. These are not um, uh, strictly necessary, um, uh, but some data sets um, will have them. Um, so in this particular data set, we do have some MRIQC derivatives. So you see this MRIQC directory that's living in the derivatives um, directory. Um, uh, for this data set, we included some code along with it, right? So we have a Python script here that compiles our events. We have a Python script that compiles our stimuli. Um, we have a, a, a um, Python script that prepares the anatomy of defacing these images and so forth. Um, and then with this particular data set, we also provided um, the stimuli. Um, and uh, for this data set, these stimuli are actually like silent um, clips, right? So um, here's you know, bird eating number two, which is this hummer, hummingbird um, uh, at a flower. And um, here is bird, oh, yeah, okay, here we go. Bird eat, bird fighting um, number two, which is these vultures um, fighting. Um, including the stimuli along with the data set um, is not always possible due to copyright issues and things like that. But particularly in the context of naturalistic data sets, um, movies and um, uh, uh, stories and things like that, it can be really important. It can be really helpful to share the stimuli as well because those stimuli are so rich and there's so many kind of features that you can extract from the stimulus, so many models that you can build um, based on a uh, naturalistic stimulus. And if you don't have the stimulus, it's hard to do much. Um, okay, so that's our example data set. I'm going to switch gears for a second here and talk about um, converting data to bids. Um, a lot of people, you know, I already collected an fMRI data set. I didn't, I didn't format it according to bids. Now I have to go share my data, you know, because the journal demands it or the funders demand it. I have to go back and um, uh, reformat the data according to bids. I'm not going to go into details about this. There are a bunch of tools out there that can help this process, like QDCon and DCM to Mix and PyBids. Um, but yeah, this can be a kind of annoying process. I've converted a lot of my own data sets and other people's data sets to bids. And usually it just boils down to, okay, person X in the lab has their own idiosyncratic way of organizing data. I really just need to build some little script or heuristic that takes their idiosyncratic um, uh, uh, data structure and, um, and and converts it to bids, and that's the worst kind of script to write because once you get it working correctly, it's important. To, it's important to sort of do it programmatically and to keep track of what's going on, right? But once you get that script working directly, it's basically like a single-use script um, that's manually tailored to that particular um, data set. That is not um, ideal. That's the hard way. Um, 
The easy way, um, however, is to use some kind of pre-specified naming convention when creating program cards on the um, uh, scanner console. And this can allow you to do automated conversion to bids. Um, this is not, I, I'm not sure that this is, um, that, that some kind of uh, a standard like this has been developed for all sorts of scanners. But for Siemens scanners, um, we have this repro in heuristic um, and this was um, created by Matteo um, Visconti di Oleggio Castello and um, Yarek uh, Halchenko. And here you can see this just a little schematic here. Basically what you're doing is if you, if you, if you follow a certain um, structure in actually creating the program card on your scanner console computer, um, you can then feed that into a program that does conversion to bids like QDCon and it can understand, okay, this is following the repro in um, uh, heuristic here, so I know how to convert all of this automatically um, to bids. And I cannot recommend this process um, enough. Um, if you're using a Siemens scanner, I would, first thing, the next time you start collecting data for a study, um, I would try to um, uh, start collecting data um, in this particular way. Um, Yarek and Mateo set this up at Dartmouth, and at Dartmouth, um, data comes hot off the scanner. It is immediately version controlled with Datalad. It is immediately converted to bids. They can even run MRIQC and things like that um, in an automated fashion um, right off the scanner. And that really facilitates, that really helps people out, really facilitates um, uh, data sharing as well. Um, and uh, at Princeton here, I think the vast majority of people that are now scanning at Princeton are also um, using the RepRoM convention um, and converting with and doing automatic bids conversion with uh, QDCon. Um, so the moral of the story here is that, um, you know, start thinking about sharing and standardization from the, from the start. You will save yourself so much time and pain if you just, um, if you just sort of like do it right from the beginning um, with sharing kind of like in mind, right? Because in most cases, you're going to have to share it anyway at some point, um, you know, based on the, again, the journal or the um, funding source uh, and, and things like that. So that's to kind of like take care of that as early as possible. Um, so you don't get to this like way down the road, have to go back and change everything and does do my analysis still run now that I re reformatted all the data and so forth. That's a nightmare. Um, uh, try to um, start the standardization process as early as possible. Okay, um, uh, one more important thing here is when you're converting data to bids, right? Um, how do you know that you've done it correctly? How do you check your work, um, so to say? And so the bids validator is, um, and the bids validator is, 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 is kind of a, a bids app in itself, right? Um, but really what the bids validator is doing is it, it, it's a lightweight tool for ensuring that your data set is bids compliant. Um, there's a browser-based version of this, but you can also do it locally um, with NPM or um, Docker, Python, et cetera. Again, if you click here, this will take you to the link um, where you can um, uh, point the browser to your uh, data set. Um, bear in mind that your data set is not ever being uploaded um, to the internet or anything like that, because that would presumably violate a lot of people's privacy and things right, like that, right? Um, it is a browser-based application, but it is running client-side locally on your um, uh, data. Um, so that's how you check that your data, that the, the data that you've converted is, is really um, uh, bids compliant. Um, I had foreshadowed this um, once or twice uh, before, but um, anybody who does um, uh, programming with Git and um, uh, uh, GitHub and things like this, um, you start to understand how critically important um, version control um, and content tracking and things like that are um, for both like um, keeping track of your own code and um, uh, maintaining a sort of like provenance, like the history of what's happened um, to your code and also distributing your code, like sharing your code on GitHub so you can have collaborators who are working on it, or you can um, package it nicely and um, uh, distribute it. Um, Datalad is, um, uh, I, I would, I would, I would uh, point you to uh, Datalad as the sort of um, go-to tool for doing similar, a similar thing to what Git does, uh, but for um, data instead of just code, right? You can't upload a big data set to GitHub, of course. Um, and so this is the kind of problem data lab is designed to solve and the way that data data lab basically uses um, a uh, Something called git annex under the hood, which is going to be 
um, tracking the content and changes to your um, uh, data set. And so you can, um, as you can see here, this is a kind of git, a git log for all of the um, uh, changes that I made to a particular data set um, uh, with Datalad. You can run code with Datalad such that it will track um, sort of the code that you ran and what the sort of input output um, of that code was. Um, and uh, Datalad also serves as a distribution for um, data sets. Uh, so Datalad, I think, is currently crawling some 240 terabytes of data that is hosted in all sorts of different places um, all over the world. Um, so in that sense, Datalad is both kind of like a, like a content tracking or version control system, and it's also like a data distribution in the same way as like a software distribution, uh, in a similar way to a software distribution. Um, Adina Wagner and um, uh, Michael Hanka and uh, Yarek Halchenko, some of the main data lab people, they have, uh, they, they, Adina in particular has put together this beautiful um, data lab handbook, which is just one of the coolest things I've ever seen. I would um, really recommend uh, checking that out for both a really kind of um, uh, 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 intuitive guide to learning data lab, but also just like a, a very uh, exhaustive, uh, amazing resource um, as well. Okay, so um, that's bids um, in general. Um, now we're going to start talking about some bids apps. Um, this is a PLOS computational biology paper from um, Chris Gorgolevsky introducing um, bids apps, how the sort of philosophy behind them in this paper also included, I mean, there's some, I don't know, there's, there's many bids apps um, at this point for all sorts of um, different things. We're gonna be focusing on um, two of them. Um, but to kind of understand what a bids app is about, right? So, so the machine readable bids format enables this kind of automated processing via um, bids apps, right? And bids apps use containerization um, to facilitate portability and reproducibility. Um, uh, what is containerization, right? Containerization is um, a, a, a way of packaging software such that all of the dependencies um, and um, uh, things like that are, are encapsulated in one single um, uh, uh, image. This is super important for um, reproducibility um, because you don't want, you know, just using system-wide installations of software that are kind of, you know, reaching into whatever, grabbing whatever environment variables, right? That really difficult to kind of reproduce um, software ecosystems that are set up like that, right? Um, and so con containerization um, uh, kind of tries to tile this into like a tight container with, you know, a version history and things like that. So, you know, if I get this bids app from here, I'm 100% sure of what is sort of going on in this um, uh, bids app when I run it. And even, you know, ideally, 10 years from now, I can grab the same version of that bids app and try to run it and it should behave in the same way because it's ideally not using things from outside of the, um, uh, outside of the container uh, in the analysis process. Um, so the main um, containerization solutions that we, or technologies that we use are Docker and um, Singularity. And so you can think of like uh, what, what goes into creating like a Docker image or a Singularity image is basically a little recipe that specifies the um, computational um, computing environment. Um, uh, what needs to be installed, where, where is it, what version, where does it get installed from, and things like that. So it builds it up, okay? And then you have, um, that, that's what's represented here um, with these little bids apps that you're, you know, you, know um, uh, you have continuous integration for testing and things like this and validation. Um, they live on um, Docker Hub and then these Docker images, if you're just running it locally, you can just use Docker to run it um, and it should be relatively robust to different sort of um, system OS's environment variables and so forth. Um, and then if you, um, people typically, you're not using Docker on a server because of certain ways uh, Docker is set up. Singularity is the um, tool that provides the analogous um, uh, uh, service for um, uh, um, multi-user servers. And I, I, I'm actually gonna mostly give singularity examples here because I'm not usually running things like locally because the data is just too big and my poor laptop can't handle that. I'm, I'm running something remotely on the institutional server. Um, and when you're on the institutional server, um, it's gonna be uh, singularity. Okay, so um, 
our first example bid zap is going to be um, MRI QC, um, which is a automated um, sort of quality control uh, 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 package uh, for um, bids formatted um, data. Um, they have this initial class one um, paper and they also um, recently had a scientific data um, paper come out. Um, one of the cool things about MRI QC is that when you run it, um, if you don't opt out, right, but it, when you run it, it's actually logging um, the kind of quality control metrics that it's um, uh, digging up out of your data, um, such that we can eventually have um, uh, a, a big sort of repository of uh, uh, these sorts of metrics so we can know like what are, what's good, what's bad, and um, so forth. So that's, that's in the process of being um, aggregated. Um, if you were to build a um, MRI QC singularity image, um, it's basically as simple as this singularity build. This is the name of your singularity image here. You're pulling it from Docker Hub. Poldrack Lab has a, um, a page on uh, Docker Hub getting the MRI QC, and here I'm specifying a particular um, version 0.15.2. Okay, I'm going to do a total sort of um, side uh, thing here. Um, because I want to talk about another one of my data sets. This is totally um, uh, uh, um, uh, self-serving advertisement here. Um, but uh, this is the data set that I'm going to use to show you examples of these um, bids derivatives from um, uh, bids apps. Um, and uh, this is the narratives data set that is currently on Open Neuro, but I'm still in the process of kind of expanding this particular uh, data set. Um, this is DS002345. There's about, there's over 300 um, uh, subjects. We should have another batch um, getting us up to 345 subjects coming relatively soon. Um, there's uh, something like 20 plus uh, different uh, audio only stories that participants listen to um, uh, with this data set and we provide the stimuli uh, as well. So anybody who's interested in um, natural language processing and um, uh, things like that, semantic representation and so forth, events representation. Um, I think this is it, it will, will be a very um, useful and helpful um, uh, data set of naturalistic um, story listening. Um, uh, the other thing that's nice about this is it's a bigger data set, right? Like this is this is a much sort of um, heftier data set um, to kind of show you the capabilities of this. And what I what what I find completely amazing, right, is that you can point something like MRI QC to this directory that contains all of these subjects and just say go, and it will it um, it will unless you screwed up the command somehow, right? It will just it can just understand how to um, do quality control on this data set with essentially no further input, right? You just say um, MRI QC subject one for me, and it reads all of the metadata out of those JSON files. It decides whether it needs to do um, this or that kind of processing step and um, gives you the uh, QC results. Um, so yeah, th th there's a bunch of, I had sort of mentioned this before, there's a bunch of stories in here, um, lots of subjects, um, uh, something like 150 hours worth of fMRI data. So I um, recommend uh, checking it out if you're into that kind of thing. Um, and um, so what is the, what is the MRI QC output uh, for this um, kind of uh, data set? Um, and here is uh, the example um, that I'll show you. Now, um, this image here is also a link. And if you click this link, um, I have set up a GitHub uh, repo that has, you know, the minimal example versions of these QC outputs that you can um, look at, look up. If you click this link, it's actually going to take you to the HTML kind of like preview of this. Um, but what's cool about that, you, you can't see that here, but is if you hover over these um, points in that, um, uh, if you actually open this HTML file, you can hover over these points, see which runs they are, see what various different things um, mean here. Um, so it's kind of like an interactive uh, plot. Um, but in general, this is just the group sort of um, uh, structural report for all of these um, 300 subjects. I won't go to any, won't really go into detail um, uh, with this. Um, I also have as an example here, the um, group uh, bold report. So for the functional data, and you can see some kind of interesting things here. Um, uh, so for example, if you look at like the, um, uh, TSNR here, it looks like we have a median TSNR around 50. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad. You can look at the frame-wise displacements um, that we have here. 
Um, again, hard to say whether that's good or bad for you. You can look at the, um, uh, the, the, the smoothness of the images that we're working with here. Um, the SNR of these images, one thing that's kind of funny about the SNR of these images is these high SNR ones are collected you know, from an older scanner using sort of older style um, uh, acquisition parameters. Um, these ones with lower SNR are, you know, newer scanner, fancier acquisition, you know, multi-slice acquisition, smaller voxels and so forth. So there's a ton of information in here. All of this information is also kind of represented in TSV files in like tabular format, right? So you can really do whatever kind of analysis. This is just their kind of like built-in um, visualization of this, but you can do whatever sorts of analyses um, that you want here. So this provides you a lot of kind of um, quality control metrics. And I, 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 I am not exaggerating when I say that it is like one line of code where you just point to the bids directory and say, give me um, subject one or give me the group or something like that. And it does all of this and generates that for you just based on the, met, the bids uh, metadata. Um, even more advanced um, is the second uh, bids app that we'll be talking about here, which is um, fMRI prep. And fMRI prep is a pre-processing pipeline um, for uh, functional fMRI data. This is uh, functional MRI data. Um, this is from also from uh, Oscar Esteban. Um, and uh, they also have a, a very recent hot off the presses um, nature protocols paper uh, uh, about analyzing task-based uh, functional MRI data that were pre-processed with um, fMRI prep. These images are links. You can click on them to get the DOI, which will take you to the papers um, to read. Oops, I have a typo here. This, this should be getting the fMRI prep um, singularity image. Um, but so similar to before, um, uh, the way that I would do this singularity build, get an fMRI prep image from Docker Hub, Poldrack Lab, specify whatever version you want. If you don't specify a version, it's going to give you the latest version. Um, that's fine too. I'm just being a little extra verbose here. Okay, so I'll use fMRI prep as our example of kind of like digging a little bit deeper into how a bids app, um, you know, what, what the kind of like inputs to a bids app are and um, uh, how you would run this with uh, singularity. So um, uh, the kind of uh, so, so uh, the, the quoting from the paper here, fMRI prep is a functional magnetic resonance imaging data processing pipeline that is designed to provide an easily accessible state-of-the-art interface that is robust to variations in scan acquisition protocols and that requires minimal user input while providing easily interpretable and comprehensive error and output um, reporting. Uh, fMRI prep, you can think of it as fMRI prep will take in your raw nifty images and it will do things like align, uh, do volume correction to align um, each, each volume that's acquired over time and the functional images align those to the T1 image and um, uh, potentially do things like slice time and correction, potentially do things like um, anatomical segmentation into CSF and white matter and also full on free surfer um, reconstruction and surface projection and things like that. And ultimately it's going to um, uh, 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 push your data into some output space um, like MNI space or um, FS average surface space or something like this. There's basically two main outputs um, that you get, um, uh, well, there, 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 there's all of this sort of um, uh, uh, visual um, error reporting and um, QC and things like that. But in addition to that, the two kind of main outputs that you get um, from, an fMRI, from running fMRI prep are a, a bunch of confound um, uh, variables that were extracted over the course of pre-processing. So that's things like head motion and derivatives of head motion and frame-wise displacement and um, uh, things like anatomical comp core and um, uh, so like uh, uh, principal component time series from your um, uh, 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 CSF and white matter and so forth, global signal um, uh, and um, motion outliers. And so it gives you a giant table that has all of these things, all of these confound variables in it so that when you go on to your GLM or you're doing resting state or something like that, you have this whole list of um, possible confound regressors that you can choose from to try to regress out or model um, in your data. And then in addition to that, it provides the actual data themselves in whatever output space or spaces that you um, uh, specified. Okay, so what is, what is the simplest kind of fMRI prep command look like? Um, this syntax here is really the case for all bids apps, right? Which is that you have this, um, uh, you, you have like the initial fMRI prep 
um, program that you're going to be running or the executable or the, the, um, the, the um, uh, what's really in this case going to be like a, a Docker singularity image. Um, you have in green here the bids folder, like the input um, directory. Um, and you have in pink here where you want the output to end up. Typically, I would be putting this inside the derivatives inside my bids directory. So um, the output folder is going to be a subdirectory called derivatives or derivatives fMRI prep um, inside your top level bids directory. Um, and then you need to specify either participant or group level analysis. And this will depend on um, the kind of bids app that you're using. In the context of fMRI prep, you're typically going to be doing, it's, gonna, it's a participant level um, um, you know, within subjects analysis. Um, uh, MRI QC is actually a little bit different, right? You know, typically you wanna run MRI QC on each of your subjects at the participant level. And then after you've done that, you can run MRI QC again, specifying group, which will aggregate um, across all of those individual subject runs of MRI QC um, and give you that um, group plot uh, like the ones that um, I showed you. So this looks relatively simple, but it does get a little more um, complicated when we take into account singularity and things like this for running on a server. Um, so here is my example of a kind of fully functioning singularity command to, to run fMRI prep. So the first, the purple here is really just calling um, singularity. We're doing singularity run here. Um, we're using this clean env um, uh, flag uh, because we don't want singularity to be sucking in any outside um, environment variables and things like that that we don't really, are, are not keeping track of things that we don't know about. Um, so we use clean env. Um, here I'm binding um, whatever my bids folder is outside of um, the singularity image and I'm just calling it data inside uh, the singularity image. Um, and then I'm, 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 I'm calling singularity on where my fMRI prep singularity image lives, which is it, here I'm just sort of, you know, it's my home directory of sorts where I have my fMRI prep version 20.1.0 singularity um, image. So I tell singularity, um, take in these flags, run this fMRI prep singularity image, um, and then everything that's following that is uh, a bunch of um, uh, fMRI prep arguments, okay? Um, and um, the ones in green here are the keyword arguments for fMRI prep. So here I'm specif specifying a participant label, just run um, participant or sub 001. I'm you know, going to use eight cores and um, I want outputs in um, T1W, FS average six, and MNI 152 nonlinear 2009 CA symmetric um, spaces. Um, one thing that's nice about fMRI prep is however many of these output spaces you, you list, it will just give you, it will run and give you all of them, um, right? So you will get outputs in all of these different spaces. You can ask for one or you can ask for half a dozen, whatever uh, suits your analysis. Um, I have a couple other things here that are not that important. Um, here I'm using the sort of field map less, um, uh, field map correction with this use sin um, susceptibility distortion correction. Um, I'm pointing to a free surfer, uh, or sorry, yeah, free surfer license file. I'm specifying where I want the work directory to be. Um, and keep in mind that for fMRI prep, the work directories can get pretty large. Um, uh, uh, we're talking many gigabytes. Um, so uh, uh, that's some, it, you want to keep those while you're still sort of like, you know, working on analysis and potentially rerunning fMRI prep or something like that. But down the road, you'll likely want to get rid of those work directories um, so they're not taking up so much space. And then finally, at this big, in this big command, um, we get uh, just those positional arguments, which is the, um, uh, uh, the input data set, the bids data set. And here again, this is the name of the data set as I have bound it inside the singularity um, image. So it's, it's, it's called data because I called it data. Um, and uh, we're saying, you know, put the outputs in data slash derivatives um, and do this at the participant level. Um, so that's your example of a NFMRI prep um, command. Um, and I'll just spend a minute here uh, before we wrap up to um, look at what these fMRI prep outputs can be. And again, this is, this is on GitHub, so you can navigate to this as well. I'll have um, the GitHub link at the end of the, um, or the, you'll be able to find the um, uh, 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 GitHub link as well. Um, so when I click on this, um, this is going to take me to a, um, HTML rendering of the fMRI prep outputs. Um, and so I can see here at the top, I have a summary. Um, so um, 
I have one structural image, this T1 weighted. I have three functional scans, two pie man runs and two tunnel um, runs. These are both, um, these are both, these are from the narratives um, uh, data collection. So these are both um, story listening data sets. Um, and here I'm asking, in this particular case, I'm asking for um, output spaces as um, uh, standard spaces in FS average and um, uh, this one, the, the sort of newest, fanciest MNI 152 and then an older MNI 152 that's sort of common for FSL people. Also some other output spaces. Um, and um, it's telling me here that FreeSurfer, um, uh, fMRI Camp also ran um, FreeSurfer in the process. So I have this input anatomical image, and here's all of the kind of cool um, uh, um, um, QC and visualization um, that I get with uh, fMRI prep. One of the main you know, concerns that people have when they look at fMRI prep is it's like, oh, well, it if it doesn't require manual intervention, then how do I know what it's doing? It's like a black box or something like this, right? And uh, that, that is not the right way um, to think about it. Um, uh, first of all, all that kind of manual intervention introduces all sorts of errors and allows you to kind of like weirdly fine tune your analysis pipeline um, in ways that maybe you shouldn't. Um, fMRI prep does that automatically based on sort of um, these community um, driven um, standards and uh, heuristics. Um, and fMRI prep is what we call a glass box, right? Which is that all of the code is, has, fMRI prep has exceptionally detailed documentation. All of the code, you can introspect any of the code, all of it, all of the errors are tracked. And basically at every stage of the analysis, you, you can see sort of what the inputs and outputs were. You can see the work, the sort of, um, you know, graph structure of the workflow and you get all of these beautiful, um, uh, um, uh, visual visualizations of what's going on at um, each stage here. Um, so this is this first one here is a you know um, tissue segmentation of the anatomical file. Um, uh, there, there's some of these don't render well in the, based on the GitHub way that I did this. Um, here you can see the surface reconstruction um, where you have like the red line outlining the peel surface and the um, blue line outlining the surface of the uh, white matter. Everything in between there is what will end up as your free surfer surface. This one looks pretty good. These data are, I don't know, five, seven years old. Um, and so this is not too bad, I would say. Um, here we get into the functional outputs. Um, so again, you have a bunch of details here, like the TR for this was 1.5 seconds, phase encoding direction was anterior to posterior. Here I did the field mapless um, SIN based um, correction. Um, and here is this giant list of all of the um, uh, confound um, uh, variables that were, that were um, created by fMRI prep over the course of pre-processing. Um, again, some of these images, some of the moving images don't show up um, in the way that I have this rendered right now. Um, but you can see how the, this is, you know, we're going to segment CSF and white uh, CSF here to get a mask that we're going to use to create the um, a comp core regressors and um, so forth, variants explained by the a comp core regressors. Um, and then a really nice um, uh, summary visualization here of um, some quality important quality metrics like global signal and um, frame wise displacement and stuff like this. You can see, um, you know, that this subject um, towards the end of this run had like a pretty nasty, you know, jerk of their um, head. And um, this is very evident in the carpet plot here. We can see it's mm, not too bad, um, but then there's a big uh, um, here towards the um, end. Um, fMRI prep provides you this correlation matrix amongst all of the nuisance variables. Um, and then we go into this for the um, other runs. Okay, so um, you can sort of explore that uh, to your heart's content. That'll be enough um, for us, I think. Um, and so I'm going to uh, wrap this up here by, again, just trying to reemphasize that, you, you know, if we want a if we want a more collaborative, scalable um, uh, neuroimaging, we need sta data standardization. Data standardization is the linchpin for this kind of um, uh, reproducible, um, scalable neuroimaging. And so uh, BIDS, I think, is the, BIDS is the top contender for this. Um, and I think it's, it, 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 that's the way it's gonna be. Um, Community-driven standard for organizing neuroimaging data that facilitates sharing and automated pre-processing. 
Vids apps are portable software containers um, that capitalize on Vids format to reproducibly analyze data with minimal manual intervention. Um, I have a couple links here at the end. Um, this points to the uh, GitHub repo where you can um, uh, look at these outputs and things like that. Um, there's a Zenodo, uh, there's like a PDF of these slides in case that's useful. And there's all sorts of other um, resources out there for understanding bids. I didn't create this talk from scratch. I was just looking at other people who have given similar talks. Um, so from the Stanford Reproducibility, Center for Reproducibility folks and um, uh, all these other bids presentations that are available on um, OSF. And then just to bring up that I am personally funded um, and giving this talk kind of on behalf of INCF and um, uh, Reponin. Um, so uh, feel free, I, I put my email at the beginning of the um, uh, slideshow and I'll be on the Brain Hack Mattermost. Um, so feel free to contact me if you have questions or want to hack or things like this. I hope, um, uh, I hope you got something out of that. Alrighty, thank you, bye bye. Hi again. Um, so now we're just going to have a brief Q&A session. And um, if Sam is here, I will invite him on stage. Cool. You disappeared, Eduardo. I did. <laughs> I was just uh, preparing for that. <laughs> ah. I mean, in case, uh, yeah, just put them in on. Cool. Hey, Sam. Hey. Hi. Thank you for the session. That was really great. Um, I was busy while you were giving it, just like compiling a hack and B document where I put in like all of the resources that everybody linked throughout the session. Um, right. So yeah, so for everybody who I guess like wasn't looking at the chat while um, Sam's presentation or Sam's recording was being presented, um, I mentioned that there's a help desk channel that's specific to bids on Mattermost, and I've pinned a HackMD document there as well. So if you know of any other resources that we haven't already put there, feel free to add those. I mean, I know that for bids, there's literally like a plethora of resources out there. Yeah, so um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them here, ask them in the channel. Um, we will keep this a bit brief because we are already behind schedule and we want to give our um, CUMP, one of our sponsors, time to do their presentation as well. Yeah, the, 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 I think that was a pretty introductory talk, so I can't imagine there are too many questions. The um, uh, check into the help desk channel, like the bids help desk channel on Mattermost for you know live question answering. We'll be kind of monitoring that. There's also yeah. many bids experts currently in attendance, right? So yes. Yeah. Um, so any question is welcome. Christine asked asked um, bids derivatives. So exciting! It's published. How about a few words about the importance? Um, so this, I, I think that this was completed in the past like couple days, right? Um, wow. um, I'm not, well, not, you know, has sort of like been was announced on Twitter uh, very recently. If I'm thinking of the correct um, thing, and Chris M is probably the most. I'm not sure if he's in here right now, but it's probably the most qualified person to talk and um, ask about this. Um, the idea being that you know we. I showed some examples of like a derivatives directory there, you know, and when I'm creating, when, I, when I'm like naming output files in the derivatives directory, um, it's, there's no, there, there, there's not, there was, there has not yet been a kind of like obvious way of um, doing that. Um, you know, when I try to do it now, it, you know, in the past like year, I try to do it according, I look up those Google Docs and I try to do it according to whatever kind of standards seem to be um, evolving, but I think those standards are becoming finalized such that your bids derivatives will be, you know, uh, output in this way that respects, that sort of recapitulates the bid structure that we already are familiar with, with this kind of right. sub-01 and, um, you know, funk and that and et cetera, and the key value kind of structure to the um, uh, uh, file names and, and so forth. Yeah, That's I guess great. it's important to not lose track of your pre-processing, processing, et cetera. Really. Yeah. Yeah, and and as you get into as you get into different sort of pre-processing um, 
modalities and things like that, right? You need to basically come up with a vocabulary for that kind of thing, right? And that that's that's a lot of the basically that's what what all what a lot of the kind of consensus building is 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 kind of trying to figure out like what are the what are the most sensible like widely used words and vocabulary that we'll use to kind of to create this sort of semantic representation of the data that people agree on. Yeah. Right. So there's a question that um to Shreef asked, which is um not all of us got time to comment on recently approved pull about a recently approved pull request about standardizing bids derivatives. Will you be amenable to comment slash feedback in the coming days? Um, I'm also I'm probably not the most qualified person to um, ask that. I would just um, or to answer that. Um, uh, I'm, I I I think that the bids community is very amenable to these kinds of um, things and just just sort of. Certain things become finalized, but the but the standards are continually like kind of evolving and being improved, right? So I suspect that that the the the, the leaders would be very amenable to that kind of thing. Just get in touch with um, there's there's oh. variety. Chris as well. Thank you. Yeah, Chris ignored my request to come on stage. So <laughs> um, yeah, I guess does anybody else have any other questions? Mm -hmm. I guess I have one. <laughs> that's <laughs> if that's okay. So uh, I work mostly. I work with humans and animals too, and and I know there is. Uh, we're working on different, you know, endpoints with uh, like rats, mice, other animals. Uh, so how how do you think the? I guess you're not. I don't know if you're familiar with animals uh, studies, but how how. In general, how how long do, we, do you think we can have an agreement on, on like, for example, rodent imaging? Um, yeah, I think, well, so my, my kind of way of thinking about it, right, is that with like optical imaging and things like this, we're, we're, especially in like, you know, mouse and things like that, we're seeing like a big, like we're, that, that is moving into the big data kind of like zone. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as you move into that kind of space in these like years, as you move into that, that kind of space, this um, uh, data standardization will become like increasingly more important if you actually want people to collaborate, right? And you don't, what you don't want is to end up, I mean, this is sort of always initially happens, right? But you don't want to end up in this kind of situation where each institution that's releasing a data set does it in its own particular format and to like yeah. use these data, you have to basically learn this institution's language or this, you know, hardware, this like proprietary hardware language or something like that, right? So I, I, I'm not, I don't know that literature well enough to sort of know what a timeline would be, right? But yeah. I expect that those things will be happening in the, in the coming years. Yeah, I mean, some labs uh, such as mine are actually using the standard bits with the animals, so trying to fit everything somewhere, but uh, yeah. it's yeah. hard to know, as you say, when it's going to be ready. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and and just convincing other people that that's like worthwhile. Um, you are yeah. saying here. I was about to mention that near data without borders. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know too much about it, but I know that it's a standard that is more commonly used in animal labs. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, there's now software that is being implemented to convert from Brooker, for example, that is very much used to bits directly. Uh, so I'll just post that too and put it on the on the hack MD. This is that's like a repro in style QDConf kind of thing for for Bruker MRI scanner. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's from a group from Korea, and uh, we've been working with them with that. I mean, using it and just trying yeah. to to improve it, and it works pretty well, I would say. Fantastic! That's cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. In case people um, are interested in animals. Yeah, um, I guess if there aren't any more questions, we should probably go on to the CONP session then. Okay, thank you so much, Sam. Cool. All right. Guys. Bye. Bye-bye.